Hi friends, I'm Todd Robinson. I am the Executive Director of Next Step Recovery Ministries. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My objective here is to be a help and encouragement to you, no matter what you're struggling with. And we all have struggles, whether those struggles are addiction, mental health issues, emotional problems, maybe a family conflict. Whatever the problem is or whatever the challenge is, we want to add value to you and your life and your family. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, so some slides here, right? Here's our agenda. Last week, we did an introduction to emotions. Tonight is highlighted sadness slash depression. The Bible will talk about, the Bible will use different words, sorrow. Um, uh, sometimes it will talk about an ache in the soul, um, sadness. So it, there'll be several different words that we'll use for, for that, that emotion, okay? So, and then happiness, we'll talk about happy, you know, there, that's an emotion, right? Happy. What are some other positive emotions that you might have? Happy, excited, excited. what else? Joyous, Joyous. you know, um, surprised. Sometimes surprise is good, you know. Think about how many words describe emotions. There's a lot of words that describe emotions that we don't think about. Proud. Yeah, yeah, that's an emotion. Uh, embarrassment we talked about last week a little bit that's an emotion that's because like we said before we are emotional creatures God designed us to be emotional so don't be afraid of your emotions we either we either are over emotional or we suppress them right and we're not supposed to be either you'll see that on the slide again here in just a minute so happiness anger anxiety worry all those things there are so many more that we can talk about but we can only pick a few to talk about and then we'll, we'll close it out the last week with mental health issues and the church and you know why do we sometimes not want to talk about mental illness why do we not want to talk about why do we why do we avoid that sometimes in the church why do we avoid those terms or those issues as Christians? We want to be the perfect okay. Really, when you think about it, 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 it comes down to your thinking. And we like to think of ourselves as Christians is that we don't have a problem with our thinking, that we got it all together. And if we had it all together, we wouldn't need the Word of God, right? If you weren't going to worry, God wouldn't tell you, hey, be careful, don't worry about anything. He tells us these things because He knows we're going to what? Worry. And then He tells us how to do it the right way. Anxiety, we said last week, anxiety. Anxiety is good when you use it right. I, I should be anxious about a test that I have coming up that I need to study for. That anxiety motivates me to do what? Study, study for the test. How many of you have woken up? in the middle of the night. I do this all the time, wake up in the middle of the night and I'm back in college and I have a test that's tomorrow and I haven't studied for it or a paper that's due and I have to write it to graduate and I haven't written it yet and like it's due tomorrow. I wake up all the time with the Eric's back there shaking his head. I wake up with that, still I'm 57 years old and I'm still having that dream back to when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. So, and I wake up and I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> that paper's due, I'm not gonna grab And then I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> that was how many years ago? <laughs> 30 something yeah, years ago, so yeah. Anyway, uh, I don't know why I said all that. Well, quick review, right, quick review. Psychology of emotions, we said last week, don't be afraid of that word psychology. Another word that we kinda think is taboo as Christians is psychology. Well, psychology is nothing but knowledge. Okay, that, that's what we're talking about here. It's really a biblical word first before it's a, a secular term, psychology. So don't be afraid of that, okay? It's, it, it's, it's a biblical word first before anything else. So um, emotions are feelings that we give meaning to, anger, embarrassment, shyness, timidity, jealousy, happy, fear, depression, worry. We said four components, four components to feeling an emotion. Number one, the situation you're in. What is happening to you at the moment? Okay, some of us will be in situations where one of us will have a rea react one way and some of us will react another way based on how we feel about it. David and Goliath. How did Saul feel about Goliath? He feared, he feared yeah, he feared him. How did David feel about Goliath? 
Yeah, he, he says, he, David's response was, I trust in God, right? Same situation, two different emotions going, happening there. Two, two different things. So they both were in the same situation, but two different responses, two different sets of emotions in that circumstance. What are the details you pay attention to in that circumstance? Some of us are more pay, pay more attention to something uh, in, a, in a situation than others. Therefore, we're more emotionally attached to that situation. The appraisal of what the situation means to you, and then what's your response? We said this last week. What's your response to emotions? How many of us start to shape when we get really angry? Anybody? Or your, your voice starts to quiver a little bit or your ears turn red or you, you sweat you turn pink and <laughs> i'm just giving chris a hard time but yeah blushing shaking crying smiling sometimes when i get angry or if i get stressed i just smile and it's that's an emotional i don't smile because i'm happy but i it's just it just happens and so uh, it, it, sometimes it gives you a false sense of how I'm really feeling, but uh, that's what I do sometimes. Scared. Yeah. <laughs> what are you about? Yeah. Why is he smiling? So, but I'm not smiling now because of those. <laughs> I'm not angry about anything right now. I'm a little concerned about the weather out there. Uh, so it's thundering pretty good. I'll always take the rain. Um, how many of you have children who respond differently to same family, same home, but they respond differently to situations? Yeah, I have to storms like a storm outside right now. You know, my kids have all respond different. They stress differently. They, they respond emotionally different to those things. I love thunderstorms. When it thunderstorms, I'm at the house, I go outside and I sit usually on the porch and I watch it until I feel like I'm about to get struck by lightning. Yeah, it is. But I love thunderstorms. I just love them. Everybody else is like, get inside. It's, you're going to get hit. Get inside. So, but I love watching uh, thunderstorms. So, oops, did I go too far? Okay, we talked about these. These are some of the chemicals in our body that are also what we would call neurotransmitters. They help to form the brain. Okay, neurotransmitters are those things, those emotions, those chemicals help to form the structure of your brain. And we'll talk about this later in here too, but how you think determines how your brain will be formed. Okay, a lot of times we used to think that the brain determined how we think. No, it's really the other way around. How you think determines how the brain will form. So your thinking is critical to how you will develop your brain physically. Your thinking has a physical reaction in your brain. We'll see that in just a minute. So that's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, because when is a child most susceptible to learning and growing and all of those things? Obviously, when they're, when they're young. I said last week, zero to three are the most formative years of a child's life. Now, by the time a child is 13 years old, a lot of times things are set. It's very difficult to change somebody, especially once they get in there. About 25, when you hit about 25 years old, it's very, very difficult to, to change. It can, it can happen. Certainly, with the Lord's power, it can happen, but it becomes, that's why the Bible tells us to train up a child, or Psalm 119 says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways. Not an old man, a young man, because the younger you get somebody, the more effective you'll be in changing their thinking and then changing their behavior. Can't, the old saying, you can't te teach an old dog new tricks. There, there's, some, there's some truth to that. It's, it's much harder to change somebody. The older we get, what we call, we get set in our ways, right? And we sometimes we just have to admit, hey, I'm... It, all of us will say, you know what, that, I, I'm just not changing on that issue. I'm not. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to behave differently on this because I've been doing it for so long. It's difficult for me to change this behavior. So, so here are your chemicals, dopamine, that's your motivating chemical, happy shots, instant gratification, major force behind addiction. Um, oxytocin, hugging, it's a social chemical, friendships, long lasting feelings, calm and safety, builds trust and relationships. Um, serotonin, another social chemical. 
uh, pride, loyalty, status, recognition from others. It motivates leaders, impacts your physical growth. Endorphins, the runner's high, it responds to pain, it pushes us. It's why exercise decreases stress. Cold showers release endorphins. Uh, um, if, you, if, you, if you jump in a cold pool, it invigorates you. Now you might not like it at first, but it will. It, it, it stimulates you. Um, it's a natural painkiller. So yesterday I had a discussion with a, with a man about his daughter who was dealing with some emotional problems. And I, I said, right, is, she see, is she getting counseling? He said, well, she's just started. And I said, well, is the doctor putting her on any medication? And he said, yes, he's putting her on a serotonin uptake inhibitor, what we call an SSRI, okay? So what that does, it reduces the serotonin in your body to force your body to make more. I said, now, what, I asked him, I said, so what can you do? You're not a counselor, you're not a therapist, dad, but what can you do to help produce more serotonin in your daughter's, in your daughter's body? And he's like, well, I don't know. Well, what does serotonin thrive on? Status, recognition from others. Um, so I said, what can you do as a father now? I love you. You're doing a great job. You can do this. I'm proud of you. I know that you think things aren't good, but really they're not as bad as you think. I said, you can, you don't have to be a counselor to do those things. We can all do, we can all. So what does that mean in the body of Christ? What should we be doing to other people? Building, Building each other up, encouraging one another. That's why God puts people in the body of Christ who specifically have, and we talked about this Sunday night, who spe specifically have the gift of what? Exhortation, encouragement. Because God's building up your serotonin. So being around other people, positive people, helps to raise your serotonin levels. That's why we shouldn't isolate from one another. God works it all together, right? He works the spiritual and the physical and the mind. He works all these things together so that we can thrive and become better people, right? So endorphins, we talked about endorphins. And then adrenaline, we talked about adrenaline last week. Um, important role in your body's fight or flight response. As a medication, it's used to increase and maintain blood pressure in short-term serious health situations. Adrenaline is the fight or flight fire. We're either gonna fight the fire or run from the fire, but in that moment, we have that burst of energy, we have that strength. Problem in today's culture is we have a generation that is living on adrenaline. And adrenaline is quick shots, not meant to be lived on, and when you're living on adrenaline, what's it doing to your body? It's tearing it down, wearing it out. You're, by the time you're 40, you're gonna look like you're 60. If you're living, if you're an adrenaline junkie and you, got, you just gotta, you're, it's gonna wear your body out. Arthritis, it's just physically, so your thinking will wear you down physically because it's just pumping those chemicals all the time into your body that your body's not designed to handle. Your thinking is critical around these things. That's why the Bible tells us to cast down those thoughts. Get rid of them. I told the guys in class yesterday, I said, uh, if you ever listen to a guy, there's a guy named Jason Redmond. He's a Navy SEAL. He was blown up in Iraq really bad. Uh, told he would never walk again. He would never do, be, do anything again. And, and, but he beat all those odds. And he's talking about when he was in that firefight, they got ambushed in Iraq. He said they were on the X. He said that was the target where they were, where they were pushing to. He said they got pinned down on the X. And when they got pinned down on the X, they were being shot at, fired at, and they were just being blown to pieces. And he kept saying, we got to get off the X. And I told the guys yesterday, that's your thinking. You got to get off the X, right? You got to get off of that. So you got to get off the X. You got to get rid of that thinking. You can't dwell on those things. You're either going to control your emotions or your emotions are going to control you. And it happens through your thinking. And it happens the successful way we do it is through the Word of God. Having verses I can go to. That's what Jesus did when he was attacked by Satan, right? What did he throw at Satan? Scripture. From what book? 
Deuteronomy and Psalms, both of those, you know. So he, there was no New Testament. He, he, the New Testament was being lived out at that time. So, all right, so those are some of the chemicals, and we'll talk about those as related to depression. Uh, the purpose of emotions, they're indicators. We said last week they're like the light that comes on, the gas light, the, the, uh, the alternator light comes in. It's telling you there's a problem or something's going on. Right? So emotions are indicators. And I said last week, the first thing we need to do with those emotions is go straight where? Straight to God. Boom! Straight to God. It engages me with God spiritually, and it gives my body and everything that's in me time to do what? Come down. Remember the old saying about anger. We are talking, you know, talking about anger earlier. Anger, you know, before you get angry, count to 10, count to 20, count to 30. There's some truth in that because it stalls everything before you say something that you're going to regret before you're going to punch somebody in the nose that you're going to regret before you go somewhere that you're going to regret it gives your body time to come down and your mind time to calm down okay so it indicates our values action and decisions are based on emotions we said last week that you will remember you will remember 6% of what I say in here tonight. Minus any notes you may take, you'll remember 6%, but you'll remember 94% of how you, how you felt, right? If you're in here tonight and the power goes out because there's a storm and the lights go out, you're gonna remember that because it's a shock to you. It, it, emotionally, even though we're used to, it's still, it's abnormal. Though It's emotionally, you're gonna remember that, right? What, is, what does PTSD or trauma come from? It comes from an event that is so abnormal that it just it takes a picture in time. How many of you have pictures in your mind of when you were a child at a specific moment, an event, uh, something that you'll remember? I have a picture in my, I get it all the time, of me, you'll laugh when you hear this, of me sitting in front of the TV set at my grandmother's house, who I just did her funeral last week, me sitting in front of her TV as a, I don't know how old I was, when Nixon resigned. I was, what year was that? 73, four, somewhere in there. You know, I was eight, nine years, but you know, yeah, but it just, I don't know why I have that, but something, you know, obviously that was a big event in history, but I just, I still see myself sitting there. It, emo, there was something emotionally that happened at that point that says, oh, picture. And then you remember that. And when there are bad things that happen to us, abuse or something like that, and we keep bringing those things back up. It, it brings those emotions back and it brings that all those bad feelings back and we respond to it just like we're still there even as a child even though we may be an adult now okay so actions decisions you it causes you to think reflect and evaluate your emotions increase your wisdom when you respond to them correctly it teaches us when I respond when, when I respond to anger correctly it teaches me when I respond to depression correctly it teaches me in a good way now it can teach me in a bad way if I respond to anger in a wrong way and I end up doing something harming somebody oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn from that but there's gonna be other consequences to that all right it resets us and it forms the brain because like we said there's neuro they're neurotransmitters all right People are controlled or dominate. Many people are controlled or dominated by, by their emotions. Some are completely disconnected and even callous to emotions, and both are unhealthy. Remember I said earlier, we don't want to suppress our emotions, but we also don't want to ride them, right? We, we, we ride those emotions like a roller coaster, right? See, the world around us, the world around us is changing by the moment. It is like a roller coaster out there. What's right today is wrong tomorrow, and what's wrong today is right tomorrow. What's up today is down tomorrow. And if we continue to ride that roller coaster, emotionally, what's that do to us? Wears us out. Get off the news. <laughs> Get off social media all the time. Get 
the reason we have the mental health problems amongst our teenagers today, the mental health depression and suicide rates today are amongst our teenagers is higher than it's ever been. Colleges are reporting skyrocketing rates of depression and anxiety and worry amongst college students at levels they have never seen before. And they attribute it to almost one thing, social media. They live on it. When my youngest goes to college, and I, I, I applaud her for this, she, she shuts down, except for occasionally, she shuts down social media. Because she knows it gets her off focus. It gets her off what she's there for. So it's, it's too, like we said last week, it's too much information coming at us all the time. And we're not designed for that. We're not designed for that information, okay? So both are unhealthy. We are created to be emotional, uh, emotional beings, but we are not to be controlled by emotions or we're not to, so we just said that. We're not to suppress emotions. So we're gonna talk tonight about what? Sadness. I drew that. You like that? Yeah. I'm, like I said last week, you'll get the art class afterwards. So all right. let's define depression or sadness, okay? Here's a psychiatric definition of, of sadness or, or depression. A persistent mood that is characterized by intense feelings of inac- inadequacy, sadness, hopelessness, pessimism, irritability, apprehension, and decreased interest in or an ability to enjoy normal activities. How many of you have ever been depressed? It's natural. It's God-given. We'll see that. All right? Depression is God. All your emotions are God-given. Whether we like that or not, you know, because we think we live in a world that tells us that if you're not feeling great all the time, something's wrong. You need to be medicated. I'm not opposed to medication. There's times for medication. I said that last week. But we're robbing God when we medicate everything away. Okay? And we'll see that in just a minute. Other definition. This is kind of a biblical definition. An ache in the soul that crushes the spirit. I've been there. Man, I've been there. I've shared with you before, seven years ago, my wife and I went through a horrible time in our life. Terrible time in our life. And it was, it, I, we, our youngest daughter at the time was suicidal, she was homicidal, she, you name it, she was it. She was gonna kill herself, she was gonna kill me, she was gonna kill her mom. And it was a bad, and it was Christmas time. I'll never forget, uh, we lived in a different house than where we live now, and we had a basement and our basement was flooding really bad. It was a Christmas time back in 2015, and the rain in 2015 at Christmas time was just nonstop. And my basement was just filling with water, filling with water, and I'd get it drained out. And I'd get it, we were running shop backs, and we were doing, it was hot, it was like 80 degrees. I mean, I was in shorts and a tank top, and it was just like, and, and, and I'd get it, I'd get, I'd get it, the water out of there, and then I'd look around and hear, it was coming up through my floor, just, I'm like, what is going on? And here's what God told me. He said, this is how your daughter feels right now. It just won't go away. It won't go. She had a Sarah. She, my, she's very, she don't mind me saying this. She's very OCD. And you, you couple that with the decreased level of serotonin. And you get a recipe for disaster. And that's where she was. And a 15-year-old, too, on top of that, right? Everything's 15. It's a t- teenage years are tough, right? So we were, my wife and I, we were in a dark, Mary was in a dark place. We were in a dark place. And it was just a rough, rough time for us. And there was one song that we hung to, if you ever heard the song, And Then Came the Morning. And we hung to that song. We sang it. We listened to it because it, it was incur- because we were like, morning's coming. We're in a dark time, but morning's going to come. We're going to get through this, and Mary's going to get through this, and we're all going to get through this, and when we get through this, we're going to be better for it. But we were, oh, we struggled. We were depressed. We were down. We wept. We cried. We begged God to give us an answer, and we didn't understand anything that was going on. 
but God gave me that, that, that basement flooding over and over. And it's like he spoke right to me. He goes, now you know how your daughter feels. It just keeps coming back and it keeps coming back and it keeps coming back. So it's a, it, our souls ached. We wept and we prayed and we begged God. And, and you know what? God likes that, doesn't he? When you are in those positions, you are closer to God than you've ever been. When I used to, de- I de- my last deployment was a six month deployment. And I was so glad when I came home from that six month deployment. But I, after I was home a couple of days, you know what I said? I said, you know, I'm not nearly as close to God after I came home as I was when I was gone. Because you draw close to God when you're away from your family and you don't have, you know, and you're down about those things. Right? You draw close. So depression hurts. God wants you to feel it. He's doing something in you. He's drawing you. He's pulling you in. And he's come close to me. I want you to feel this because he wants to comfort you. We think something's wrong. And, and usually there's a circumstance that's wrong. But God's not wrong. And he's doing something in us during these times. Who do we see that deals with depression in the Bible? Job. Job. How about King David? King David wept in his depression. Read the Psalms. Many of the Psalms are King David's depression as he cries out to God for comfort and healing in those times of his broken spirit. Right? So Job... David, we see so many people in the Bible who, Paul, we saw that last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, when he said what in 2 Corinthians chapter 1? I have the sentence of death in me. Because of his circumstances, he was saying, I just want to die. That's where I am. I'm so discouraged and I'm so down that God, if you decided to take me right now, I'd be okay with it. That, that's a tough place to be. I don't think he was suicidal, but I think he was saying, God, if you take me right now, I'll be okay with it, right? So issues related to depression, it affects your physical health. It affects your beliefs. When Mary was going through that time, she questioned everything. She questioned everything because she couldn't... Why is God doing this to me? Why is this happening? And everything that came, she, and, and what was my role and her mom's role? Keep bringing her back to truth. Keep, what, 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 when we talk about the armor of God, right? We're talking about the armor of God in our Sunday school class. When we talk about the armor, what's the first piece of armor that's mentioned? The belt of truth. We had to keep bringing her back to truth. Back to truth. Back to truth. What have I done to deserve this? I'm being punished by God. Satan's attacking me. She had all these things that were coming at her all the time. Her belief system was being attacked at every turn. And our job was to keep bringing her back and bringing her back. I looked at my wife one day and I said, what if we weren't here? What if she had a different family that wasn't doing this? I told my wife, I said, now you see how people turn to drugs and alcohol when they get to these places because they don't know what to do with it. And that scared, that scared me to death to think you've got to keep, you've got to have somebody when you're in that position of depression, discouragement, you've got to have somebody in your life that's bringing you back where? Back to truth. And if you don't have those people, you're going to struggle. That's why church is so important, right? And the preaching of the word is so important. It affects our thoughts, our perceptions, how we see things. When you're, when you're in that state, man, everything is bad. Mm-hmm. Everything. It affects our relationship to God and others. She constantly questioned her relationship to God. She wanted to get saved every day because she was convinced if she just got saved again and again and again and again and again, it would go away. And I kept telling Mary, I said, this is not something that's going to go. We, we, this is a fight. We're in a fight. We're in a fight for your life. Let's fight. 
Let's not keep praying about God. I, I think you need to save me again. You know, I said that's not the issue here. This, this, this is this is this is a physical issue. It's a spiritual issue, and it's a soul issue. It's all of them. It's all of that's because that's what depression does to us. It, it helped. It, we view our circumstances differently. We and, and we view our sins differently. Sometimes we justify them when we're in that state of, of that mindset of, of depression and sadness. So let's talk about some of these here. And I'm going to say some things you may say, oh, I've never heard that before, Todd. Bipolar depression. What is bipolar? It used to be called what? Manic, depressive. It's the up, down, up. I'm way up and then I'm way down. I dealt with a lady here for years, for years, who was bipolar. And all of her bipolarism was based on her circumstances. Most of the research out there today says bipolarism is usually based not on a chemical problem, but on circumstantial problems. Because the world is doing this. And if you ride it, It'll take you right with it. So bipolar is typically caused by circumstances. I'm not saying there's not times when there might be a chemical imbalance, but typically, most of the time, bipolarism is caused by you riding the circumstances of life up and down and up and down and up and down and not trusting. Yet it's a, it's a double-mindedness. And what's the Bible say about a double-minded man or woman? They are unstable, <laughs> and this woman was extremely unstable, and what she would continually turn to were pills. Now, for a while, I had her turning to the Word of God, and when we got her turning to the Word of God, she, her life started to change. But then she, something would happen. A new problem would come along, and she would go back to her old ways, and you had to bring her back. <laughs> And then when you, when you addressed it with her, all of a sudden you became the bad guy. You'll be the bad guy or, 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 or girl. You'll be the bad person. A lot of times you'll be the bad person. If you give them truth, you'll be the bad person. But keep, never stop. Give them truth until they won't listen to it anymore. Okay? Then there's unipolar, you, what's a, a uni, uni, unipolar, bipolar is obviously up, down, unipolar, you're, you're just in a continuous low all the time. You know, the, the manic, the bipolar is up and down, up and down. I, I know people who are melancholy. A lot of it's, pers some of this is personality driven. People who have a melancholy personality, they're always going to seem down, depressed. A lot of times it's just the way they're designed, who they are. Okay? They're serious, they're focused, but they're, you know, they're always so focused on things that they see the negative in a lot of things sometimes. So they're always kind of down. They might complain a lot, but they're always down, this, that continuous. Then there's circumstantial depression. Here's some references, too, where you'll see these in the Bible. I won't go there, but circumstantial depression, Ruth 1, 19 through 22. If you want to see some depression, read the book of Ruth. <clears throat> Conceptual depression, Lamentations 3, 7 through 18. Concealed sin depression. If I'm in sin and trying to hide it, it's going to affect me. Right? That's right. King David. Psalm 38 is his <laughs> laying it all out. That concealed sin. I'm, 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 you know, I'm living a double life. We all have things in our lives. Don't get me wrong. We all have things in our lives that we don't want people to know. But if you could get inside my head, you'd probably run real fast. Right? <laughs> you'd probably say, man, Todd, you something wrong with you. Right? But that's all of us. But I'm talking, I'm talking the things that we're trying, the double life we're trying to live. And if you're, it, will lead, it can lead you down a very dark path in your thinking. Right? So we have to be careful with that. That's why confession is good for the soul and the heart. That's right. It is so good. I did it. I'm guilty. I'm sorry. You're right. Confrontation. That's hard to do. Nathan had to confront David. You are the man. You did it, David. You. You're the one who did this sin. You take responsibility for it. Can I ask you a question? Yes, Joe? sir. 
There's a statistic out there that, uh, and I know you relate to this because you're a veteran, 22 veterans a day commit suicide. Right. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on what you think they're dealing with as far as this goes? Let, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready. To, in October, I'm teaching a class on why people die by suicide. And I wasn't really going to include it in here, but I, I'll, I'll touch on it. Yeah. There's a lot of research out there. That is, there's three factors that have to that have to typically be in place for somebody to commit to kill themselves. Okay, number one is they have to feel like they're a burden to other people. Number two, they feel that they are worthless. And number three is the most critical one because we are geared for life. We, we fight to live, right? So when you think about when somebody takes their life, and I just dealt with this, we just had a, men, a guy, one of our graduates take his life a couple weeks ago, we just did the funeral for him last Tuesday, you know, and you think, man, what is going through his head when he was just down at the men's home that day, that evening, talking to the guys in a good spirits. You never know what's going on with somebody. But the third thing that has to be in place is the ability to take your life. And usually that's got to come through experience. And in the military, with a lot of combat veterans, what do they have experience in? Death. What are our teenagers getting more and more experience in? Through video games? violent video games. It has the same effect. Your brain doesn't differentiate between the two. Your brain does not. When my son was growing up, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, I, I was very, I stayed on top of what he played video game wise. Tried to the best I could, you know, and had to limit that because the, the, the and now you couple that with, it's on TV. It's on the internet. YouTube, you can get just about anything you want on YouTube. Violent. So amongst our, our teenagers and our young adults, they are now gaining the ability to, where death is not a big deal. So those three factors have to be in place. And more and more and more, that third factor, which is the most critical factor, is in place for many of our young people and our teenagers and our military. And that's why you see the skyrocketing rates, I'm convinced, um, in, our, in our military. Because the more combat we've had over the last 20 years, Afghanistan, Iraq, all those different places, it's in, in the trauma, the PTSD. Um, and, and, I, and I do p personally believe that the way the military counsels PTSD is flawed. It's a very flawed way they do it. That's a whole different story, but we'll go into that some other time. So. But that's a great question. Worldly influences on our mind that will drive some of these ways of thinking, okay? You have dominant experiences in your life that go all the way back to when you were born, where you grew up, your home. What was your home life like? Were you in church? What was your family like? What was your neighborhood like? I, I grew up in a rough neighborhood. I, I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood. Um, I, I didn't grow up in the best... <laughs> up until I was about 12. When I was 12, we moved. I guess my dad started making more money because we moved. But uh, we moved out of that neighborhood. But I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood. So, you know, that affects the way you think later in life. It affects who you, makes, it, it, it develops who you are, right? And then damaging experiences in your life. The death of a, of a mom or a dad. Divorce. Divorce is more damaging on a child than death. Death they can accept. Divorce is difficult because they feel they've been abandoned. I went through that as a child. My mom and dad divorced. They had been divorcing since I was about 10. They didn't divorce until I was 16. And so for six years of my life, I went through this up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. But by the time they divorced, I had developed other friendships and relationships that I poured into, but it taught me not to trust anybody. So I didn't trust anybody. So I still, to this day, I have trust issues. So I have to learn to trust people. 
because I don't, it's it, in, in me, what was trained in me through this experience was you can't trust anybody. My, my sister, it sent her in a cocaine addiction, alcohol. For my brother, it sent him, and he was younger, it sent him into uh, a life, he spent a lifetime of depression. Now, he's come through that. My sister's come through that. You know, we've, we've had our trials and we've had our things we've had to deal with and we've learned to deal with them. And, and uh, uh, they have a closer relationship with the Lord today than they've ever had. And that's what's brought them through these, th through these things. But they will tell you that you, we can relate all of this back to my mom and dad. I love my mom and dad to death. They're both saved today. They serve the Lord. They're not married to each other. <laughs> they have wonderful spouses, each of them. And, and uh, uh, my mom just is, she's a firehouse. Uh, she's just pff, firecracker for the Lord. My dad, he goes on mission trips. You know, he, Vietnam and here, and he's going, to, I mean, he just goes places. He's getting older now, so he's slowed down a little bit. But um, uh, so they, they serve God. But that's what's brought all of us through those issues was our walk with the Lord, and developing that to, to come to a point where we can all forgive and move on, right? So circumstances, abuse, divorce, these things are going to form your mind and they form it very early in your life. Think back to what happened in my childhood that may have had a damaging effect or a dominant effect on my life because that was forming your your brain, it's, for, it's forming who you are and how you think. So th let's talk about the chemistry here of sadness. The chemistry of sadness, research, this is an interesting statement, okay? Researchers continue to try to understand the mechanisms of depression, including brain chemicals, in hopes of finding explanations of, of these complexities and developing more effective treatments. Depression is a multifaceted condition, and what they're saying is we don't understand it. <laughs> we don't understand how depression works nor where it comes from sometimes, it, but it, it, it's complicated. But having an awareness of brain chemistry can be useful for medical and mental health professionals, researchers, and many who have depression. So depression is, is, is complicated because it, uh, it, it comes to us all differently. Some of us will experience something and it won't depress us and some of us will. My, even in my family, things are different. You know, things don't bother me that might bother my wife. And why didn't that bother? I don't know why it doesn't bother me, but it does her or vice versa. Things might bother me that don't, that don't bother her. I, I, she'll kill me probably when I say this. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> don't say it. Yeah, that's right. Don't say it. She asked me last week, she goes, how much did you talk about me? You know, and <laughs> so, I like things put away and where they're supposed to be. And, you know, and if there's laundry in the laundry basket, it shouldn't be in the laundry basket. It should be in the drawers. Right. You know, and the, and she's kind of like, oh, we'll get to it when we get to it, you know. And, and, and it, it, if I walk into a, a house or a place where things aren't where they're supposed to be, it drives me crazy. <laughs> but if she can walk into that same room and go, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like OCD. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like OCD. <laughs> right, right. So you need, you're about the dishes too. You yeah, I hate dishes in the sink. Oh, yeah. He was upset that one day you come to the yeah. place and you just talking about the dishes and you yeah. get so mad. Yeah, I was like, man, dishes in the sink, dishwasher, you know. So I've learned put the dishes in the dishwasher. Don't, stop, don't complain about it, just do it. Just take care of it. Or don't say anything at all. Just love my wife. <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, I've learned that. I had to learn that over the, just because, you know what I found out? That getting mad about it doesn't solve anything. <laughs> it just makes it worse. Yeah. So... You only learned it because she taught you. That's right. She, she taught me well. So, uh, uh, it could be an abnormal plate in the body of the following chemicals, your dopamine, your serotonin, your, your adrenaline. Again, those, it could be an abnormal play of these chemicals. It might not be, it might not be the chemicals that are doing it in terms of uh, the chemicals are the cause, but your thinking is the cause that drives the chemicals. It's, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? 
We're, we're, science is leaning more to the way of your thinking is what's causing the chemical problem, not chemical problems are causing the thinking, but rather your thinking is what's causing the chemical problem. You are the driver of the chemicals in your body. Now, I will say this. When Mary was going through her issues, when we went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you know, he at the she, we had a wonderful doctor. And she said this. She, she really dug in deep as we were trying to figure out what's going on here. And she, she asked us this question, a series of questions about her childhood. And she asked this. She said, has Mary ever spiked an extremely high temperature? And I said, well, when she was about three years old, she spiked a temperature of 106. And she said, that will do some damage to the brain, which may have an impact now on how her brain is responding right now to this situation. So could there be a physical problem? Yes. That's why I'm saying that that's not, it's, it's a complicated issue. That's why I always, if you think medication is the best thing, so for Mary, we went to medication and counseling. No medic, if you're gonna go medication, I said this last week, you're gonna go medication, you gotta go to, gotta do both, right? We gotta do both, all right? So I'm gonna move, because we're running out of time. People who experience depression usually relate it back to a traumatic experience, okay? Some experiences in our life, we just talked about that might even be confused. They might even be confused about what caused the depression and say that there's no specific thing causing the depression. In other words, they don't remember. There might be some things that were there, but we just, we forget those things. We forget about those things, but it still had an effect on us, okay? Depression is often attributed to low levels of these chemicals that we just showed. Question, we just talked about this. Does negative thinking cause the low levels of the chemical or do low levels cause the depression? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? And it could be yes and yes, depending on what's happening. It's hard to crack open your head and look at your brain and tell, right? That's the problem we have. It's easier for me if you have a break, broken arm, I can x-ray your arm. Uh, you know, it's hard to really x-ray the brain. Now, obviously, there's ways we can measure brain waves and thinking and things like that. But still, when your arm messes up, it just it, 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 it inhibits your use of that arm. When your brain messes up, you do crazy things. <laughs> it's like the hard drive, right? Your, your, your brain is the hard drive, and the information you put into it is the software and your brain is gonna respond with what you put in. This computer, will do, this computer will do whatever I program it to do, good or bad. Whatever I put in there, it doesn't care. Your brain doesn't care. It's a physical, whoops, this is, a, this is, this is an empty container. It doesn't care what I put in it. I could put good stuff, I could put candy in there and hand it around, everybody have candy, right? Oh man, this is great. Or I could po put poison in there and pass it around. It, it doesn't care. That's your brain. It doesn't care what you put in there. God cares what you put in there. So therefore, the Bible, He tells you, this is what you need to be putting in your brain. Things that are true. Things that are honest. Things that are pure. Things that are lovely. Things that are of a good report. Think on these things. God is telling us what the software should be that goes into the hardware so that it will operate correctly. But when I'm filling my brain with the things that are on the news, when I'm filling my brain with the things that are on video games, when I'm filling my brain with the things that are on social media, when I'm filling my brain with pornography or whatever it is, with, with, when I'm filling my, guess what I'm gonna get? I'm gonna get, I'm, that's what I'm gonna get out of my life. That's a thinking I'm going to get. So, so here's your, well, the Bible says this, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your thinking will define you. 
The Bible said this long before science figured it out. Science is just catching up to this. Just now getting back, they're just now getting in the game with, with what the Bible had already been saying. Okay, so in your, when you're thinking, you have these things in your brain called dendrites, okay? When you think, in your brain, this little dendrite, he starts to vibrate. And there's a, it's got a cell structure, and it's got a little, it, it, this cell starts to vibrate. And when you think, it causes that vibration to start. So you're thinking, which is an immaterial thing. Think you can't, thinking is immaterial, right? I can't touch it, I can't, I can't see it, but it's there. We know it's there because it happens in my brain, right? So it, uh, it starts to vibrate these cells in your brain. And as those, as those little cells start to vibrate, they start to grow. And they grow, and they grow, and they grow into things we call neuro pathways. Neuro pathways start to form in your, so your thinking now creates neuro pathways in your brain. And the stronger those neuro pathways become, that's what you become. Proverbs 23, 7. So as you're thinking, those neuro, so I can develop nice, healthy pathways, or I can develop dead, nasty, dark pathways. And the older I get, and the more I've been thinking corruptly, the stronger that's going to get, and the weaker that's going to get. So the Bible has a solution to that, and it's called Romans 12, 1 and 2. The renewing of my mind. The renewing of the mind. God is saying, you got to get... Now, it never goes away. Pathways never go away, but they, they can become less dominant. And the Word of God can become more dominant. But that's where I have triggers in my life that lead me back to old ways of thinking. A song plays on the radio, a smell comes in, and it triggers all of a sudden a thought I haven't had in 20 years pops up, right? I've walked out of stores before because of music, a song comes on in the store that triggers me back to where I used to be. And I say, I gotta, I, I gotta get out of here. Or I can do what? I think I'll stay and listen. That's dangerous, right? That's a dangerous place to be. Real quick, the Bible and depression. Depression is an emotion created by God to help us get through the difficult and uncomfortable parts of life. Sorrow, yeah, I want you to see this. This is God, right? This is Ecclesiastes 7.3. Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, says what? Sorrow is better than what? Sorrow is better than laughter. For by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. A different spin on depression. Depression is to make your heart better. And if I think my only solution is medication, I'm not going to get better. I'm not discounting medication. But if the only solution is medication, your heart's not going to get better. Because the Bible tells me that sorrow is better than laughter. Sorrow teaches me more than laughter. Failure teaches me for more than success. When I fail at something, I learn something. When I'm successful at something, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, it's great, you know. But sorrow, it teaches me something. I always say it's odd to learn more at funerals. Than you do that's right. Days. That's right. You, you bet. Depression helps us know there are better times ahead. Hope is the key to overcoming depression. The world won't give you hope. Jesus Christ gives us hope. This world does not have any answers. This world doesn't have any solutions. So if your hope is in, well, maybe the world will get better, you're going to be very depressed <laughs> and you'll stay depressed. Hope does not come from the world. It comes from the Word, right? But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. In other words, you don't want to, you don't want to be in depression and have no hope 
or have hope that only the world has. He goes, he, he says, what? He goes, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to, I don't want you to do that. That's not, that's not going to help you. If your hope is only, well, no, hopefully the things will get better in the world. You're going to be very, very expectations, unmet expectations only help worsen depression, not make it better. So how do we comfort those in depression? Romans 12 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. When, I, when somebody's down, what do I want to do? Hey, man, you know, it's a, but you know what? It's, you can do that, but what a lot of people, when they're down, you know what they just want you to do? Just no, be there. Just be there. Yeah. They don't really want you to feel sorry for them. They just want you to, to, you know, hey, I love you, man. I'm here for you. How, how can I help you? What can I do? Man, just, will you just pray with me? Will you just, you know, will you just, just hang out with me for a while? We don't have to be their cure. God is working something in them. What was God working in Job? A greater knowledge of who God was. Job was already upright and righteous, but at the end of it, God said, Job said, before I knew about God, now I know him. When you come through depression, like we went through seven years ago, oh, I'm gonna tell you what, buddy. We still talk about it. Even with Mary. We, Mary goes, remember that time? <laughs> you know? And she still has her struggles. She still has them. And I have to remind her who she is. I have to remind her of those things. Conclusion, real quick. And I'm going to share a quick story with you. Conclusion. This is, this is the mental health verse of the Bible. Okay? And I know I'm running over. Three, third John 1, 2. Beloved. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Your soul is your what? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. John says this, that I want you to prosper as your soul prospers. He didn't say I want you to prosper as your bank account prospers. I don't want you to prosper as your vehicles prosper. I want you to prosper as your soul, as your mental state prospers. Because when my mental state prospers, then everything else prospers. Everything else, no matter what my circumstances are, understand that what bad circumstances, God's working. Good circumstances, God's working, but bad circumstances, God's working even more, right? And we have to have that perspective. I'm gonna show you this picture. This is my, my granddaughter six months old, having her first taste of Greek yogurt. And she was not yeah. happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quick story, and we're closing. I know I'm running over. Quick story. I have a good friend of mine, one of my best friends in the world. And several years ago, and I, I, I'm not going to say names. I'll just share it. Several years ago, they had an issue. His wife had an issue. And I remember him telling me that it really got her in a deep, dark place. And he texts me the other day and he goes, pray, we may be back in that situation again. And I texted him back, I said, I'm praying, brother. I said, I know this is really, really hard on XYZ. And he texted me back, he said, he said, Todd, he said, she has grown so close, close to the Lord over the last two years that it's not even, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's not bother. He said, but she's a completely different, completely, he said, no anxiety about it, no worry about it, no depression about it, no, none of that. Why? because she's drawn up close to God. She's in the Word. She's memorizing Scripture. She's developed a dynamic prayer life with God. She's pouring into other people. He said, completely, completely different. Completely different. 
I was like, that is, and I, I texted him back because they got a good report. And I said, God is the great physician, mentally, physically, and spiritually, right? Any questions real quick? I know I'm over with questions. Because next week we'll talk about happiness. Is that all right? <laughs> so happy, happy stuff. Let's pray and we'll get out. Father, we again, we thank you. Thank you for, I thank you for our emotions. We thank you for depression. Lord, we, we struggle to say that sometimes. We thank you. We thank you in the trials. We thank you in the depression. We thank you uh, in these things that you bring our way because you use it to strengthen us, to draw us closer to you, Father. Lord, the world doesn't understand depression, but you do. You understand it and we just follow you. Lord, we, we, will, we will be successful in getting through these things, Father. Thank you that you provided medication if we need to go that route. Thank you that you provided us good counsel, good godly counsel to go along with that, Father. But at the end of the day, help us draw close to you and understand that you've created every single emotion for us so that we can prosper. Just as 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 says, that our soul may prosper. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us today for our session. If you or a family member or anybody you know needs further help from us, please contact us at www.nextstepmen.org.